going to be looking at some words from that passage that we read in John 19. Uh, but before we actually get to that, um, famous last words. Somehow we're particularly interested in them, aren't we? The last thing someone has to say on this earth as they face death, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, seems to have a special fascination, doesn't it? Especially if they were famous in this life. There's the, the somewhat um, prosaic, I'm shot, I'm shot, John Lennon, outside his apartment building in New York in 1980. During the American Civil War, um, General John Sedgwick of the Union Army and his men were, were dodging Confederate snipers' bullets near Spotsylvania Courthouse in Virginia in 1864. And his men were sort of hunkering down and um, hiding away. And uh, the general said to them with some disdain, standing behind them, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. They clearly could. They could hit a Union general. That was, those were his last words. Or the, the intriguing, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Apparently the last words of Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, dying of cancer in October 2011. And then of course there are the humorous. Not actually his last words, but his epitaph on his tombstone and in Irish Gaelic. This was the, voted as, in a poll as the UK's favourite epitaph, apparently. Uh, I translate from the Irish Gaelic, Spike Milligan, I told you I was ill. But more seriously, the inspiring. Patrick Hamilton was only 24 when he was burnt at the stake outside St. Salvatore's College in St. Andrews in February 1528. The spot is marked by the initials PH in the cobblestones. You can go and see them today. He'd been preaching the truths of the Reformation. In other words, he'd been preaching the gospel, which he had learned from Martin Luther in Germany. Remember, this is only 11 years after the 95 Theses incident. But the Roman Catholic authorities couldn't stand that, and they swiftly condemned him to death. And he suffered for six long hours at the stake. His last words were, How long, O Lord, shall darkness cover this realm? How long wilt thou suffer this tyranny of man? And like Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Or the content and encouraging words of the Apostle Paul towards the end of his life, writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And of course, the triumphant. And with this we come to, to Jesus' final words on the cross. It is finished. In the words of Philip Bliss that we just sung, lifted up was he to die, it is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high, hallelujah, what a saviour. Were those of Charles Wesley, which we'll sing in a wee while. Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own, accomplished is the sacrifice, the great redeeming work is done. Tis finished. All the debt is paid, justice divine is satisfied, the grand and full atonement made. God for a guilty world hath died. Now you have those words in your hand and that bit of paper. So if you remember nothing else, 
of what I say, if you take away that hymn of Wesley, mm -hmm. <coughs> you have the gist of all that I'm going to say, what the truth is, what it means to be when Jesus said, it is finished. Arthur Pink uh, um, pointed out uh, some time ago uh, that uh, he says, this was not the despairing cry of a helpless martyr. It was not the last gasp of a worn out life. No, rather it was the declaration on the part of the divine redeemer that all which he came from heaven to earth to do was now done. That all that was needed to reveal the full character of God had now been accomplished. That all that was required by the law before sinners could be saved had now been performed. That the full price of our redemption was now paid. Now the reference in all this of course is to this passage we read from John chapter 19 and it's interesting that the Apostle John is the only one who records these words of the Saviour on the cross. Uh, I say words, but in fact in the Greek, uh, it is only one word, uh, the word tetelestai. Now, thinking about it, I assume that Jesus spoke in Aramaic. One would think so, and that this is itself a translation what he said into the Greek, tetelestai, but it's very, very um, telling that this is the Greek word that was used by the Apostle John, he was there, he heard it, to describe what Jesus had said. It's in, uh, I'll bore you with a bit of Greek grammar now, so if you're not interested in Greek grammar. Um, it's in the perfect tense, indicative mood, and passive voice of the verb teleo, to make an end of something, to accomplish or complete it. Uh, not merely to end it, but to carry it through and bring it to perfection or its destined goal. That's what the Greek lexicon says. Uh, archaeologists have found examples of this word written across ancient documents to indicate that a bill had been paid in full. How wonderfully descriptive of Jesus' death that is, isn't it? Mm. The perfect tense. The action was completed in the past with results continuing into the present. Mm. When while Jesus finished the work, he finished that day, the results are still in effect today. It's in the indicative mood. The act that took place is an objective fact. The work that Jesus finished was definite and real. Furthermore, Jesus speaks in the passive voice, which indicates that he is receiving or being subjected to an action without responding or initiating a response. He laid down his life. No one took it from him. End of the Greek lesson. Now all that is really by way of introduction. Uh, what I want to do is to examine this saying of our Lord Jesus uh, by following the, the thinking of, of one of the Puritans, uh, John Flavel, uh, who expounded this in his work, The Fountain of Life. Flavel lived between 1628 and 1691, and almost his entire ministry was in Dartmouth in Devon, including some very pointed and pithy sermons directed to the rough seafaring men found in and around that port. Now, Flavel agrees that it is finished was a triumphant shout by the Lord Jesus. And he also points out that it's one word in the original. But he says in this one, in that one word is contained the sum of all joy, the very spirit of all divine consolation. And I pray that we'll be able to understand something of that this morning. So, what is finished? We've already alluded to some answers to that question. 
uh, some see in this an end to all the legal types and ceremonies of the Old Testament. And some see the, the finishing and fulfillment of all the prophecies concerned with Christ's incarnation, his life and death. In fact, if you look at the, cha the chapter, the Apostle John seems to make a point of noting the prophecies fulfilled in the circumstances of his death. Look at verses 24, 28, 36, 37, all prophecies that John says were fulfilled in these actions around the death of Christ. But, says Flavel, while all that is true, it's not the whole or principal sense of the word which must refer to, quote, the finishing or completing of the whole design and project of our redemption. Now, after the Puritan pattern, Flavel then propounds this doctrine, which he addresses in various ways. And here it is. Here's the, here's, here's the doctrine he's going to talk about. That Jesus Christ has, hath perfected and completely finished the great work of redemption committed to him by God the Father. And three questions arise from this. What was the work? How did Christ finish that work? And what evidences are there that the work was finished? And we'll look at each of these uh, briefly in turn. So first of all, what was the work which Christ finished by his death? It was the fulfilling of the whole law of God in our place and for our redemption. He acted as our sponsor, our surety, our guarantor. Uh, and Flavel describes what he says as, is a, sub a subjective and an effective fulfillment. Uh, sometimes the Puritans use words that we wouldn't really use. What he means is, subjectively, Jesus was perfect in his being. He was born the Holy One before he had done anything. As the angel uh, tells Mary in Luke 1.35, Christ alone is the holy, blameless, pure one set apart from sinners. Hebrews 7, 26. So Christ in himself is holy. And it's an, an effective fulfillment um, of the whole law of God because Jesus actually did fulfill all righteousness. He did all that was commanded and he suffered all that was threatened in the law. There was no flaw whatsoever in either his active or passive obedience. He truly and really finished the work his father had given him to do, as he says in his high priestly prayer in John 17. Flavel then notes some characteristics of this finished work. First of all, it was a necessary work. And it was necessary, first of all, on the Father's account. Once God had decreed and determined to redeem sinners by Jesus Christ, then it was necessary that the counsel of God should be fulfilled. It was necessary on the Father's account. It was necessary with respect to Christ because of, to use Flavel's expression, that precious compact between Father and Son. He's talking about the covenant of redemption before the world was between the Father and the Son that the, that the uh, Son would redeem a people. And of course it was necessary on our account. <coughs> Otherwise sin would have destroyed us completely and no one would ever see God. Jesus said the Son of Man must it's a necessity. He must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. It was a necessary work. And it was a difficult work. Think of the cost of this work to our Savior. Yes, there is the, the physical suffering and torture of the scourging and crucifixion that we've just been reading about. But there's also the suffering in his spirit. 
Think of his agonies in Gethsemane. Think of the separation from his father experienced on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even angels, while they could minister to him in his temptation, they could not lift the burden which Christ bore. Jeremiah says in Lamentations, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. How difficult was this work? And thirdly, it was a precious work. It's the everlasting theme of the songs of the angels and saints. We began our praise with that. Worthy the Lamb. Think of the oh-so-precious mercies which flow from it. Justification, sanctification, adoption, and the endless happiness and glory of the world to come, glorification. How precious is the work. So that was the work. How did Jesus Christ finish this glorious work? And, and by this flavor means, in what manner did Jesus act in finishing this work? And he lists uh, four ways. He did it obediently. Remember Philippians 2.8, what Paul says, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. For in Isaiah's words, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, Isaiah 55 and 6. Jesus was obedient in his suffering. And he suffered freely. We've already seen this from the implication of the use of the passive voice in the word tetelestai. Remember, Jesus said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. <clears throat> Jesus delighted to do the Father's will. This was not something grudging. He delighted to do the Father's will which was that he should lay down his life for all that the Father had given him. So he did it obediently, he did it freely, and he did it diligently. We read that Jesus went about doing good. He was weary, so weary that he could sleep in the stern of a small boat in a wild storm on the Sea of Galilee. He was so engaged in the work that he forgot to eat at times. Says Flavel, the very moments of his time were all employed for God to finish this work. Diligently and fully, there's nothing that anyone, men or angels, can add to this finished work of Christ. What the law demanded has been perfectly fulfilled and paid. Whatever the sinner needs, has been perfectly obtained and purchased. So the Lord Jesus did his great work obediently, freely, diligently, and fully. Which brings us to Flavel's third question. What are the evidences that Christ thus finished redemption work? Well, he says there's the evidence of souls fully redeemed from the curse of the law. Because the work of redemption done by Christ was finished, his obedience and blood are sufficient to actually accomplish all the purpose for which he died. 
And then secondly, the evidence of Christ's resurrection, ascension, and sitting at the right hand of God demonstrate that the Father accepted the Son's sacrifice as full discharge or acquittal from the debt for sin. In 1 Timothy 3.16 we read, He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And in Hebrews 10, 12 to 14, we read, But when this priest, that is Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The evidence of Christ's resurrection, ascension, and sitting at the right hand of God. And thirdly, says Flavel, there is the evidence of the effects on all who believe. On Christians. Consciences purified. He alludes to Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Consciences purified and souls at death received into glory having confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Flavel points out that if Christ had but almost done that work we had been but almost saved that is certainly damned. So propounded the doctrine and he's um, proceeded to look at that and ask questions about it and now he draws uh, just six, these are very brief, inferences from it. Uh, we might call them the application of the doctrine to us. And the first one is this, because Christ perfected and completely finished all his work for us, this is a sweet relief to believers against all the defects and imperfections of the works of God wrought by us. For all our duties are done imperfectly. None of our work is finished completely, but in Him we are complete. Although we cannot obey perfectly, the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us, as Paul says in Romans 8. Through Christ's obedience imputed, imputed to us, like put to our account. We should be humbled because of the defectiveness of our work and service, but we should not be discouraged. Instead of our righteousness, we have His. Sweet relief. And the second inference is this. Christ finished his work with his own hand and it is therefore dangerous and dishonourable for us to seek add, to add anything to the righteousness of Christ as far as seeking justification before God is concerned. There are so many people who think that by doing good they can in some way turn God in their favour. I've sat with people evangelistic classes and they explain what sin is and why Christ had to die and they say but I'm a good person not really Flavel writing when he does of course uh, in the 17th century uh, points out that there's no need for the continual sacrifice of the mass to be offered. It is, was a once for all sacrifice. There's no need for the sacrament of penance to be carried out in this life. There's no need for a purgatory to be born in the next. He says it's a hard thing to bring these proud hearts to live upon Christ for righteousness. We would fain add our penny to make up Christ's Son. Third inference. Just as Christ finished his work for us, 
he will certainly finish his work in us. Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author and perfecter. In the authorised version, which will be familiar to many of you, he is the author and finisher of faith. It is inconceivable that Christ should at the end lose any for whom he offered himself up. James Grierson was a minister of the gospel in Errol in Perthshire for 56 years. Imagine being a minister for 56 years. You'd love to have had a minister for 56 years. The inexhaustible riches of expounding the word of God for 56 years. I suppose he was like a, a 19th century Willie Still or something like that from Aberdeen. He was over 50 years there. He was in the Church of Scotland then after the disruption in 1843 in the Free Church of Scotland. At the end of his life in January 1875, he was asked by one of his children, You are quite happy, aren't you, Father? <coughs> uh, Grierson replied, Oh, yes. Quite happy. I have every assurance. The work for me is all done, and the work in me is nearly so. Fourth inference. Because Christ's work of redemption is complete and finished, faith in that becomes the most grateful says Flavel, the most grateful, acceptable, and well-pleasing work to God that a creature can perform. Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Faith. Number five, Christ worked out all that the Father gave him to do so that we should labor all our lives for him. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we need, of course, to know that nothing of the work Christ did remains for us to do. His work was satisfying the law, fulfilling all righteousness. But we must work to show our thankfulness to him, to glorify God by our obedience, and to let our light shine before men. And in this we should imitate the pattern of Christ. And Flavel lists a number of ways. Begin early in life to work for God. Work hard and zealously. <coughs> Be diligent because the time is short. Don't spoil what work you do, you do accomplish by pride in it. Don't be discouraged by opposition and temptations. Don't be weary of well-doing but persevere to the end just as Christ's life and labour ended together. His final inference is this, as Christ finished the work given to him, we must see that we finish the work God has given us to do. Consider this, your work can never be done after you're dead. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, said Jesus. Night is coming when no one can work. Labour then finishes with a warning and a gospel appeal. If you have neglected Christ, remember that the season of mercy will be over at death. Jesus lamented over Jerusalem, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. If you have not finished your work with care, you can never finish your course in this life with joy. Chiefly, that's the, the work of believing in Christ, of having faith. Flavel concludes, dare you go before the judgment seat in a Christless state. Make Christ sure now and die in peace. As a kind of, of commentary on all this, uh, here are some words from, from J.C. Ryle, that great 19th century Anglican evangelical. He adds a, a note of caution, but also 
of great comfort. It's surely uh, not too much to say, he says, that of all the seven famous sayings of Christ on the cross, none is more remarkable than this, which John alone has recorded. The precise meaning of this wondrous expression, it is finished, is a point which the Holy Spirit has not thought good to reveal to us. There is a depth about it we must all instinctively feel, which man has probably no line to fathom. Yet there is perhaps no irreverence in conjecturing the thoughts that were in our Lord's mind when the word was spoken, the finishing of all the known and unknown sufferings which he came to endure as our substitute, the finishing of the ceremonial law which he came to wind up and fulfil as the true sacrifice for sin, the finishing of the many prophecies which he came to accomplish, the finishing of the great work of man's redemption which was now close at hand. All this we need not doubt our Lord had in view when he said, it is finished. That will be familiar to you. There may have been more behind for anything we know, says uh, um, Ryle. <clears throat> but in handling the language of such a being as our Saviour on such an occasion, and at so mysterious a crisis of his history, it is well to be cautious. The place we stand on is holy ground. One comfortable thought at all events stand out, stands out most clearly on the face of this famous expression. We rest our souls on a finished work if we rest them on the work of Jesus Christ the Lord. We need not fear that either sin or Satan or law shall condemn us at the last day. We may lean back on the thought that we have a Saviour who has done all, paid all, accomplished all, performed all that is necessary for our salvation. We may take up the challenge of the Apostle, who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for, we, for, for us. When we look at our own works, we may well be ashamed of their imperfections. But when we look at the finished work of Christ, we may feel peace. We are complete in him if we believe. As we come towards a a close. My friend uh, Douglas Taylor died in June uh, 2014. I can't believe it's uh, eight years ago now. He'd been diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer three years before that and he'd had to give up his work as assistant editor at the Banner of Truth Trust in Edinburgh. And not long after he was diagnosed he started in June 2011 a more or less daily blog under the title Works Worth Declaring. And he continued this until not long before his death, always seeking to glorify the wonderful works of God. And the text at the head of the blog is Psalm 118, verse 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. <clears throat> Douglas realized that he had a work for the Lord to be accomplished and that he wouldn't die until that was complete. I suppose you could say that his blog was three years of last words. Uh, in 2016, Banner of Truth published a selection of the blog posts in a little book, using that verse as a title, I shall not die, but live. <clears throat> and as we finish this morning, I want to read you part of one of those posts, written on the 15th of November 2011. And it's entitled appropriately, It Is Finished. Here are some of Douglas's last words. The dark hours at Calvary lasted until the work of redemption was finished. Then our Saviour cried with a loud voice, It is finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Then the light began to return. This is where the eyes of our faith must be directed. This is where the guilty find cleansing and the weary find rest. 
that the arm of the Lord must be revealed and his power exerted toward us before we can see anything in the death of Christ for sinners. Imagination is not enough here. In fact, it's a hindrance. Yet when these things are preached or declared, the Spirit often takes the truth and applies it with power to the heart. And the truth is most wonderful. The price was paid. The account was settled. It is said that archaeologists have found the single Greek word here rendered, it is finished, written over first century bills. It meant that every demand had been met, everything was covered, everything necessary had been done. This is what we are to believe. This is where our hearts are to rest. Is this where your heart rests? In the finished work of Christ? Do you believe that everything necessary has been done for your salvation? Can you, to use the, the subtitle here of Douglas's book, be assured of facing death with gospel hope? James McGoldrick was a much loved professor of church history at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in South Carolina. On Christmas Eve last year, he began to write out his testimony for his family and friends, and here's what he wrote. Dear family and friends, as the year 2021 is ending, it is an opportune time to reflect on fundamental issues of life, some about temporal, temporal concerns, others about eternity. God has given me a long and enjoyable pilgrimage in this life and a firm confidence that he has prepared a home for me in heaven. I know where I came from, I know why I am here, and I know where I am going. Therefore I believe staunchly that our Lord has created me by the exercise of his sovereign will, so I am not just another animal produced by an impersonal force. I know why I am here, to glorify my maker and to enjoy him forever. This knowledge obtained by careful study of the Holy Scripture enables me to face the future unafraid. I know it is my Saviour who has taken all my sins upon himself and paid the entire price of forgiveness for me and for all who repent of their offences. As the Apostle Paul wrote, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As I wrote this letter, says McGoldrick, my hand shook, not because I was excited with joy, but because I learned a few days ago that my part in this journey is likely to be complete and I will go to heaven very soon. Dr. McGoldrick was too weak to finish his dying testimony. However, <clears throat> some unfinished works conclude on a memorable note, and this is no exception. I will go to heaven very soon. He did, six days later. It is finished. Death, hell, and sin are now subdued. All grace is now to sinners given, and lo, I plead the atoning blood. And in thy right I claim 